Hello everyone, you're tuned into today's PIR live event and I'm your host Scott Jones. Remember that you can tweet your questions anytime during the half an hour using the hashtag AskPIR and I will relay them to our guests during the question and answer period. If there's room in your tweet, please include your name, school or city so we can give you a shout out. Our guest today then is uh, Dr. Kim Harcombe. Dr. Harcombe is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at McEwen University and uh, she's going to tell us a bit about her research here and then uh, after that we'll get to some of those questions. Go ahead Dr. Harcombe. Hey, thanks Scott. Okay so before we talk about research I'm going to give you a little bit of background into um, sort of the field that I work in. So we're going to be talking about antibiotics today. Um, now I'm sure that pretty much everyone that's talked that's watching has taken antibiotics. It's pretty hard in our society to get um, very far without having taken anything. It might have been if you've ever had strep throat or an ear infection, pink eye. Um, so those are some of the most common ones, especially as kids that we take antibiotics um, for. Um, you may have taken them as pills or sometimes, especially for younger kids, they give you antibiotics as a solution. Um, my favorite was always the banana flavored penicillin when I got strep throat. All of these um, fall into this category of antibiotics. And so most of the time when we get sick and we are given antibiotics, we don't really think about what they actually are. So I'm just going to spend a minute talking about um, what they are. So I've got a slide to show you here. Um, so antibiotics, um, there's a lot of different kinds. They all sort of have the same general properties. They either they kill bacteria or stop the bacteria from growing. Um, so that's what helps us if we have an infection, that's what helps us to get better from the infection. And so because of that, they're used to treat bacterial diseases. Some of the things I listed before, strep throat, ear infections, they're used to treat pneumonia, skin infections, a lot of other more serious things. They can't treat viruses, so that's why if you get a cold, you can't take antibiotics for it. They don't work. Um, so most of us are generally, most people are generally aware that that's what antibiotics are for. Um, not a lot of people ever think about where they come from. Uh, most people assume that it's some chemist in a lab coat just synthesizes these antibiotics using a bunch of chemicals. And um, that's not actually what happens at all. Um, so the antibiotics that we use typically are actually natural products that are made from other bacteria. So these are usually soil bacteria, so the kind that are out in the dirt in your garden. Um, and they actually produce antibiotics naturally as a way of killing their neighbors so that they can basically outcompete out them for food and for space. And so as humans, what we've done is we've found these antibiotics in the soil and we've found ways of uh, making the bacteria produce them and we can then extract or purify them and put them into pills or into those, that banana flavored penicillin liquid or things like that. But then as humans, we can take that when we're sick. So for the last 60 years or so, 60 or 70 years, that's where our antibiotics have always come from, is from these soil bacteria and also a few species of fungus that live in the dirt. So that's sort of where the antibiotics are coming from. Um, now, <coughs> for a long time, these have worked really, really well. Um, we've used antibiotics to treat all sorts of infections, and typically, most of you probably have experienced this. You take antibiotics, you get sick, you take the antibiotics, and with a day or two, you feel better. And that's usually how they work. Um, the problem is that in the, the last, especially the last 20 years or so, um, some bacteria have found ways to survive antibiotics. So rather than being killed when we take the antibiotics, they have ways of resisting it. So we call that antibiotic resistance. And what that means is if you get sick and you take the antibiotic, it doesn't work. So I've got an example. I'm going to show you a little graph so you can kind of see what this looks like. So this example is, sorry, this example is based on one specific antibiotic called azithromycin. It's not a common one, so you probably haven't taken it yourself. It's often used to treat skin infections and ear infections. Um, and on this graph, if you look at the blue line, that's showing sales of this azithromycin. So in other words, how much of this antibiotic are humans using? And as the use of azithromycin increases, you can see the red line is showing how many different bacteria have become resistant to that, that antibiotic. 
And so as the blue line grows, goes up, so does the red line. So as we use the antibiotic more, the bacteria get really good at surviving it. And so after a while, this antibiotic doesn't actually work anymore to treat infections. And so once that happens, we can't use azithromycin anymore. And so in the past, what's usually happened is that then the doctors will then give you a different antibiotic. And if that one stops working, they give you another antibiotic. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the problem is that eventually um, we've actually started to run out of antibiotics um, because we have a bunch of bacteria that have basically become resistant to most of the antibiotics that, that we have available to us. And so these are called superbugs. Now, a lot of people hear the term superbug in the media, and what they end up picturing is some sort of crazy superhero bacterium that has these like amazing superpowers. Um, that's actually not that far off from reality. So these bacteria um, that we classify as superbugs, <laughs> what they actually what their characteristics are is they cause ser usually serious infections. They're resistant to either most or all of the current medical antibiotics that we have. So if you get sick with a superbug, um, we can't, there's no drugs to treat it, which is a very scary thing. Um, and the extra scary thing is that these superbugs can actually spread their resistance to other bacteria. So once they're resistant, they can actually spread so they can spread genetic material or DNA. They can send that information about how to be resistant to their neighbors. And so they can actually turn other bacteria into superbugs as well. And so that's really scary because these bacteria, first of all, we can't treat them. And they're spreading this information about how to be resistant to other bacteria. So that's a really big concern right now. Um, all over the world, people are trying to figure out ways to deal with superbugs or ways to find different drugs that will work against superbugs. So for the last couple of minutes, what I wanted to show you guys is um, some of the work that um, my lab has been doing, a couple of my students have been working on trying to find um, alternatives to antibiotics that might be useful in treating people that have superbug infections. So I'm gonna show you um, a little bit of what we've done. So we've decided rather than looking at soil bacteria, because that's where we've always found antibiotics before, and what we found is that we've actually found most of the antibiotics in the soil. So we're having a hard time finding more. Um, people go and look in soil bacteria and all we find is that antibiotics we already know about. So we've decided to look somewhere completely different. We are actually looking at plants. Um, so I'm gonna show you one of the plants we're looking at. Um, we've actually looked at a variety of different plants. The picture that um, that's shared on the slide is one of the, the ones. It's quite pretty. Um, but we've identified a bunch of different plants we think might potentially have the ability to produce chemicals that kill bacteria. So we've taken these plants, uh, we grind them up into a powder, and then do a chemical extraction. And usually this involves mixing them with ethanol and other solvents and trying to extract the chemicals out of the plant so that we can get a solution of the, the stuff that's in the plant. Um, and so <coughs> I have a, sorry, just a second. There we go. So I've got, if I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is one of our plant extracts. It's really, it just looks like a brown liquid. But what this is, is this is a liquid that contains all of the different chemicals that are produced by that, that plant that I showed you on the, the screen. And so we've taken this extract, and then what we do is we try to see if it can kill bacteria. And so I'm gonna show you one more picture. And so what this picture is showing Oh, sorry, just a second. There we go. So what this picture is showing, this is essentially um, an, a Petri plate. It's a little growth dish that we grow bacteria in. And so the part around the outside that looks sort of cloudy, that's actually bacteria growing on the plate. And so I've got a little arrow here pointing at where the bacteria are growing. You can see it looks kind of gray in the picture. And so on these little white circles, what we've done is we've actually added the plant, the liquid that we got from the plants, and we put them onto these little white um, paper discs and put them on top of the bacteria. So this is where the plant chemicals would be added. 
And what we've looked for is we're looking to see if any of the plant chemicals kill the bacteria. Now, this plate is actually from an extract that does kill bacteria. So you can see around each circle, there's a little ring that looks black. That's where the bacteria are dead. And so that's where the chemicals from the plant are actually killing the bacteria in this region. And so that shows that this chemical um, that this plant produces might actually be effective in helping us to kill bacteria, maybe even these superbugs that we can no longer use antibiotics against. And so we've now tested about 11 different plants, and we found about, um, I think, seven of them actually produce chemicals that can kill bacteria, um, certain different kinds of bacteria. And so that's a really good start to help us to look for these new antibar, new drugs that we can use against antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So that's a little bit about what my research is. Great. Okay. Thanks, Kim. Um, so you, you talked um, about superbugs, and it's certainly something that we're starting to hear more about. Uh, is it the case that antibiotics are, are just not working like they, they used to, or are there more, more bugs out there, or, or what's going on? So what's happened is that the, the bacteria are this more or less the same ones that have always been there. But what the bacteria actually have been doing is... Um, bacteria, most people don't know this, but they're really good at swapping DNA with each other and swapping information. And so there's a small group of bacteria that had information about how to be resistant, and they've actually been sharing that with other bacteria. And so the ability to be resistant or to survive antibiotics has been spreading very, very quickly. And the more we use antibiotics, the more the bacteria will spread that information and it's selecting for the bacteria to do that. And so that produces lots and lots of bacteria that are resistant. And so really the fact that they're superbugs is actually human's fault because we've used the antibiotics so much that we sort of cause the bacteria to become resistant. Okay. So, so as, um, as hosts for these bacteria, then are, are there any things that we can, can do to, to prevent them from becoming resistant or... Yes, actually, there's a lot of things we can do, and a lot of them uh, like that every person can do themselves are really simple. So things like not using antibiotics when, um, when you don't need them. So if you have a cold or a flu or a stomach flu or something like that, those are viruses, and they can't be treated by antibiotics, so you shouldn't use antibiotics. Um, if you do have a bacterial infection and you're given antibiotics, um, you need to make sure you take all of the antibiotics right to the end of the prescription, and that ensures that all of the bacteria are killed and there's not a few resistant ones that survive and then start to grow, and those are the ones that become a problem. So those are some things that we can do. Um, on a bigger scale, um, some of the things that hopefully governments are going to start to do is things like um, reducing the amount of antibiotics that are used in, in agriculture. So um, there's a lot of uh, farm animals are fed antibiotics, um, and that's something that contributes as well to antibiotic resistance. And so hopefully in the next few years, um, that will be reduced because a lot of governments are putting laws in place to stop that practice. Very good. Okay. Uh, so just a quick reminder to our guests that you can submit your questions to our guest today, uh, Dr. Harcombe, using the hashtag AskPIR on Twitter. Um, so it looks like we do have a few questions coming in from St. Elizabeth Seton, grade 5 class in Burlington. Um, one of them being, could you use recycled materials to make antibiotics? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, there's, most antibiotics are produced by living organisms, and so it, it's, it, that kind of antibiotic is, it would be difficult to use recycled materials. Um, but there's a lot of research going on now where people are trying to come up with new things that can be used to kill bacteria when the, the normal antibiotics stop working. And a lot of those things are chemicals that you maybe wouldn't necessarily think um, would make good antibiotics. And so there's always a chance that there's some chemical out there that you might be able to, to find that could help to inhibit bacterial growth. Right. Um, however, most of them are usually things that are produced by natural sources. So they come from plants or fungus or bacteria. Um, people are looking in the oceans, actually, and finding some chemicals that look like they'd be good antibiotics as well. Okay. So I guess nature's pretty good at it already. Then. Yes. Okay. Way better than humans are, actually. All right. Okay. Um, I'll stick with the same same class there. Uh, kind of follows up from what you were saying a bit earlier, which is, 
um, how do the bacteria spread the information uh, to each other in order to become resistant? So that's, it's a really complicated process, but the, the simplified version of it is actually when you have, if you have a bacterium that has some information it wants to spread, it actually attaches itself to another bacterium and the two cells actually fuse themselves together and they kind of create a little passageway between the two cells and the cell with the information actually passes DNA to the other cell directly. And so they're actually literally swapping their genetic information. So it's a very, very direct process. Okay. Um, and that's why they're so good at, at sharing information. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, specifically, uh, again, uh, coming from a grade 5 class in Burlington, uh, how do people con contract superbugs? Um, and are superbugs um, a threat worldwide? So I'll ask you, answer the second question first. So okay. the superbug threat... Um, is worldwide. Um, they found basically every country in the world has different superbugs. They're not not all superbugs are found everywhere, but because humans travel a lot and we're in contact with each other a lot, what we've been finding is that if a superbug appears in one country, then it doesn't take too long before it starts to show up in other countries. Um, there was recently one that was identified. Um, in China, actually, um, that is completely resistant to every antibiotic we know about. And just last, just a couple days ago, I saw an article showing that that superbug, the information from that superbug was just found in the United States. So that it's actually spread from China to other, quite a few other countries. Um, so that's, it's sort of, uh, yeah, they're, they're everywhere. Um, so the other part of the question was what was... Uh, was how do people contract yeah. superbugs? How do you contract them? Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, some of the, the most common place to get a superbug is actually from the hospital. Um, so because using antibiotics helps to create superbugs because it selects for the resistant ones. And the place where the most antibiotics are used is a hospital because that's where there's a lot of sick people getting antibiotic treatment. And so... The, the first place that we typically see superbugs is in places like hospitals, also long-term care facilities, um, and other healthcare facilities. And then as they become more common, um, then you start to see them outside of the hospitals. And there's quite a few other places, especially some of the more common ones um, can be picked up in things like locker rooms and, um, all, and places where there's lots of contact between people. Okay. Um, so, so knowing that then, what, what would you say is the best way for our viewers to, to stay infection free and to avoid these, these types of bugs? The best thing is just to wash your hands. Okay. That's, it's the simplest thing, but it's also the easiest thing to do. Um, and especially if you do, if you're going to visit someone in the hospital or you're going to visit somebody who's in a, in a care, care home or something, um, to wash your hands, especially like while you're there and also after you leave. Because even if you do get the bacteria on your skin, they won't necessarily, and actually a lot of superbugs won't make you sick just because you touch them. Um, you can carry them around on your skin and not get sick. It's only when something happens that causes those bacteria to get into your body that then they start to make you sick. And so if you, if you wash your hands regularly, um, you can protect yourself from getting infections from them, even if you come into contact with them. Okay, good. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to, to follow up on was, um, so you talked about plants and how they have antibiotic properties. Um, what exactly was it that steered you towards the certain plants that you do study in order to look at them for their antibiotic yeah. properties? So the plants that we chose, we actually picked them for a very specific reason. So um, I actually work in collaboration with a chemist. He's the one that does the extractions because I don't have the skills for that part of the, the research. I do the bacteria part. So, um, and he's actually from Kenya. And he's really, from when he was growing up, he became really familiar with a lot of plants that are used in traditional medicine in Africa. They're used, like they're steeped into teas and things and people drink them to help if they get sick. Um, often because in some parts of Africa, they don't have access to medications. And so instead they use the plants that grow around them um, as a way of producing these traditional medicine products. And so he came up with a variety of these different plants that have traditional medicine uses in Africa. And he got, he actually last time he went to Kenya to visit his family, he got some samples 
and made the extracts, and then we brought them back to Canada and tested them. And so that's actually how we came up with the, the list of plants. And so, like I said, we've tested about 11 different plants that are used in Africa, mostly in Africa and Asia, um, to make traditional medicines. And we found that they, a lot of them seem to have antibiotic properties and can kill bacteria. Okay. Um, so these bacteria that the antibiotics uh, work on, do they affect just, just humans or do they affect, say, animals in the wild as well? Um, they can, yeah. So there's a, there's kind of a bunch of different kinds of bacteria that can cause infection. Some of them only infect humans. Um, some will only infect animals, and then some, they're called zoonotic, they'll go back and forth. So they can cause infections in animals and in humans. Um, and so um, depending on the different kinds of bacteria, um, you can use antibiotics to treat infections with any of those. So um, if your your cat gets sick with a bacterial infection, for example, you typically use the same antibiotics that would be used to treat a human infection. They're very okay. similar. Okay. Um, so I'll go back to, to Twitter here. Um, St. Elizabeth Seton in Burlington, Ontario. Um, how many superbugs have been identified worldwide? Oh, that's a hard question. There's a lot. Um, every time I go and do some reading about it, I find out about new ones. Um it's tough with bacteria because bacteria, because they share so much information, um, sometimes it's hard to tell whether all whether you're looking at two different kinds of bacteria or if they're just the same bacterium that's been sharing information. So, um, so I can't give you a number, but there probably have been I would say dozens to hundreds of different kinds of antibiotic resistant infections. Some of the most common ones that you might have heard of. Um, Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. Um, it's called usually MRSA if you hear about it in the news. That's a really common one. Um, that's one that started out in hospitals but now is common in community settings as well. It's one that you can pick up in a locker room at the gym. Okay. Um, there's um, antibiotic resistant tuberculosis, which is not something that is most of most Canadians worry about, but especially in parts of the world where tuberculosis is a very common infection, uh, it's an infection of the lungs. There's a lot of superbug tuberculosis out there that is hard to treat. Okay, um, those are two of the most common ones. There's a another group called the uh, Carbapenem resistant Enterococci. It's a whole big group of bacteria that have all shared genetic and shared their DNA, and they've become resistant to a bunch of different drugs. Okay, uh, so I presume all these different bugs do, do different things to the, the yeah. human body, and um, as you're working with the bacteria in your labs, are there any special precautions that you have to take? Yeah, so the, the, the picture I showed you of that experiment, that was actually one of my undergraduate students did that, um, did that um, experiment. He was in his third year of his, um, of his university education. And so when he did that, when he was working with the bacteria, because some of the bacteria that we test the, the compounds against are, um, they are pathogenic, they can cause disease. So he has to, first of all, you have to wear protective equipment. So he wears a lab coat as well as gloves when he handles them. He also works with them in something called a biosafety cabinet. It's sort of like in TV, you might have seen, it's on TV, they make it a little bit more dramatic. But on TV, you've seen where they're working in where they put their hands in gloves and they reach into a cabinet to manipulate things. It's not quite like that, but it's basically a box that has a closed air system. And so you can put the bacteria inside of this box and the bacteria, um, even if they get out of the experiment, they get they stay contained within the box and they don't end up in the, the larger room. And so there's a little gap in the bottom about this, this tall that you stick your hands in and then you can do your experiments. But it keeps... Um, the bacteria in a, in a clean space that's isolated from the rest of the lab. Um, we also have special disposal procedures. So after he's done with his experiments, all of the bacteria and all of the waste he creates while he's doing his experiments are put in something called an autoclave. It's essentially, it's a big high pressure chamber that heats up to 121 degrees Celsius, so above boiling, and that will kill all bacteria. And so after he's done an experiment, everything goes in the autoclave to sterilize it so that it doesn't get out of the lab and, and ca cause anyone to get sick. Okay. Uh, and where do you get the bacteria in the first place to begin with? Are you growing them right in the lab? or? 
Yep, yep, we grow. We, so we have, um, we have stock. So essentially we have some bacteria that we keep in the freezer. And every time we do an experiment, we take them out and grow them onto these little, these agar plates. That basically they're just a plastic dish containing bacteria food. Um, and so we grow them and then we can use them to do experiments. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure we have some uh, aspiring biologists out there. Um, can you maybe walk us through like a typical day in the life of a biologist and uh, maybe provide some advice for anyone out there wanting to get into what you do? Well, a, a day in the life of a biologist, it kind of depends. But one thing that most people don't realize is that we do a lot of waiting around. Um, so when you do experiments on live organisms, often you have to wait for them to grow. And so, especially for microbiologists, which is what I am, I work on bacteria, um, most bacteria take one to two days to grow before you can use them in an experiment. So you have to plan ahead. So usually, if you're doing an experiment the day before, you get the bacteria out of the freezer and start your little, your, start your culture, you start them growing, and you put them in an incubator that's basically, it's just, a, it looks like a fridge, but it's usually at a warm temperature, and um, you let them grow, and usually overnight or for a day or two, until there's enough bacteria there, and then you can do your experiment. Um, so you spend a lot of time waiting for things to grow. Um, some of the other, I do some other research on a different kind of bacteria called Streptomyces, and they actually take a week to grow. So I have to plan really far in advance if I want to do an experiment, because I have to get them growing the week before. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so is there any... Um field components like do you have to go and get the, these plants that you need or, or is someone else doing that or? so yeah so for this experiment um the somebody else has gone and gotten the plants and made the extracts for us okay. um i have done other experiments i've got some some um other students that have worked on projects where they've been looking at soil bacteria looking to see if we even though there's not a lot of new antibiotics in the soil we've been looking to see if we can find interesting bacteria in the soil that might have antibiotic properties and so those students actually go out um, into the river valley in edmonton or into the parks around where the university is and they actually collect soil samples and isolate the bacteria right out of the soil that's just from the area around where we work okay um, maybe time for, for one more question here. Um, sometimes you hear, and I don't know whether it's a, an old wives' tale or if it's just a myth, but you hear that it's good for children growing up to, to get to go outside and play in the dirt and play in the sandbox uh, in order to become resistant going forward. Is that actually true? Would you recommend something like that? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there's something called the hygiene hypothesis. And what it, what it actually says is that if we're too clean, our immune system doesn't develop properly. Um, we've evolved so that our immune system, we need to get dirty and we need to be exposed to bacteria and other infections to help us develop our immune systems. And so the theory is that um, people in North America, we like to wash everything a lot and we don't go and play in the dirt as much as we used to. And as a result, our immune systems don't develop as well, and that can potentially lead to things like asthma and allergies and things that are essentially our immune system isn't working properly, and that leads to those conditions. So I actually have a two-and-a-half-year-old, and I give her every opportunity I can to go and get dirty and stick things in her mouth that have been on the ground, and she gets sick, but she gets over it, and I'm hoping that by the time she's grown up she'll be a lot healthier because of it right is there a certain age after which um that theory no longer applies like do you have to do that while you're really young or yeah it's it's most of the the theory says that most of the immune system development happens in younger children so probably maybe up until teen teenage years um is when a lot of that immune system development happens so yeah so definitely my two-year-old is a, a good age to be getting dirty great, great okay uh it looks like is up um so i'd like to say thank you again to our live stream viewers and of course to you dr T kim harcomb for taking the time to share your expertise and answer our questions today thank you so much thank you uh just do a quick plug before we sign off for our next couple events uh, we've got one next week, uh, Thursday, June 9th, when we'll learn about biomechanics and rehabilitation after an injury. And then Thursday, June 16th, I think our final one before the summer, when we'll talk with a space engineer 
about his experiences and what it really means to be an engineer. Uh, until then, uh, see you next time, everyone.